Yuma, welcome to Floriad Reimagined and Let's Talk. I'm Dan Borsch and it's great to have your company in these unusual times of COVID-19. Uh, and I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians, the Ngunnawal people who have managed and maintained culture, language, this land, sustainability for many thousands of years. So important to acknowledge that as we start and have these conversations about sustainability now and into the future. And you're probably wondering why this is online. We have a very small audience here, as many as we're allowed under the COVID-19 restrictions. Everyone is physically distanced. And of course, hand sanitizer is everywhere. And that's why it's so important that we share this uh, with you on the Floriad website, where there's also plenty of information about how you can get involved in the reimagined celebration of spring this year. Uh, and I just want to pay a special thanks to our sponsors, the ACT Government, the National Capital Authority, Canberra Centre and National Circuit, without whom we wouldn't be able to have events like this, uh, which while we're physically distanced, it's more important than ever to be socially connected. And that sense of community, well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about with this book here, The Edible Garden Cookbook and Growing Guide by Paul West, who's with us now. Good afternoon. Hi, Dan. Great to have you along. Oh, such a pleasure. <laughs> and uh, what you said about it being a small audience before, uh, it's massive. <laughs> Just like you can't see it. I know you can't see it on the live thing, but there's uh, there's about 5,000 people in this auditorium. Wow. All socially distanced. <laughs> Hello, everyone at the back. Can you see us? <laughs> the atmosphere here is electric. <laughs> oh, well, I'm feeling G'd up already. <laughs> You're a TV host, uh, oh. an oyster farmer, an author. <laughs> is there anything you don't do? Uh, oh. I, I actually went through this with my wife the other day. Um, about all the different jobs that I've done uh, in my life, <laughs> and it's um, it'd be a bit too much to put on a business card. Right. I think as uh, I don't know, I don't know if there's anything that I don't do. I'd certainly have a go at anything. Right. That's uh, um, but yeah, th I'm yet to kind of come across something. Actually, probably one thing I don't do is um, one thing. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> One thing. I do lots of things. Right, right. So you don't, you don't limit yourself <laughs> to just or one thing. Or make good jokes, <laughs> perhaps. Might be the other thing that I uh, don't do. Um, that went off way better in my head. <laughs> you got some it was a sim zinger. sympathy yeah. laughs. It yeah, was... but, that's, but, but when you have to explain the joke afterwards, you know, and add the comedy to it after the joke, it's... Uh, yeah, that's it, desperate times for me. It might have me. been more the receiver rather than the issue. <laughs> no, it was me. Well, <laughs> you can never blame yourself. If a joke doesn't land, it's never the audience's fault. It's, uh, it's the delivery. What is the Edible Garden? Uh, so the Edible Garden is, I guess, where my focus went after in life after River Cottage. Mm. Um, I was down on the south coast of New South Wales from 2013 to 2016, shooting the, the, the Foxtel production River Cottage Australia, which is now shown on SBS as well. And um, when it wrapped up uh, and the farm got sold and, and I was at a bit of a loose end, I guess I had to reimagine uh, or maybe not reimagine, but think about what it was that the program uh, was actually, what it stood for, because mm -hmm. it... I think it was more of a success than Pete, anyone had anticipated. Of. Well, let's jump back for anyone okay. who's not familiar with it. Yeah, okay. what, what is anyone here not familiar with the River, River Cottage? Because there's a door there. You're, you're, <laughs> you're also going to have a big audience online. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's, a just, little, there's a button up there to press. <laughs> they might be the just, subscribe just discovering you now. Yeah, well, uh, so River Cottage <laughs> Australia was the Australian um, adaptation of a UK format uh, that basically... We took over a small farm in central Tilba, 20 acres ex dairy property. And when I moved there, it was a farmhouse and uh, a boundary fence. And that's about it. And um, over the course of four years, the, the, the television production followed my journey of going from um, someone who had more of just a cooking background as a chef mm -hmm. to, uh, to somewhat of a primary producer. You know, not necessarily, um, I don't think I could ever really call myself a farmer. Uh, more like a hobby farmer. River Coach is kind of like hobby farming on TV. Um, but it was a really amazing experience because as, as, um, as a consumer of meat uh, and as someone who had worked at a relatively high-end uh, restaurant and a consumer of produce, I should say, you get a really, you, especially from the cookery uh, and the chefing part of it, you get a really, you're taught how to, um, how to judge produce, basically, before mm -hmm. it goes into a meal. 
And um, I thought I had a really good understanding of what went into producing amazing food um, because as a chef, you kind of feel like that's what you do, you know. It's, uh, you take raw ingredients, you, you do your kitchen wizardry to it, and then you make amazing food. But what I uh, came to appreciate during the time on the River Coach Farm was that the, the kind of knowledge and passion uh, of chefs has to be matched or bettered in every single way by the passion of primary producers as well because yeah, anyone has everyone here tried to grow food at home or successfully grown food at home because you know it's like people say oh homegrown always tastes better that's a lie homegrown often tastes better homegrown can taste way way better but it doesn't always <laughs> taste better because even if it's some supermarket produce that's been picked in western australia shipped over here uh chances are it was grown by someone who really knows how to grow a cabbage uh whereas if you've tried to put a cabbage into your backyard and it's been smashed by moths and you didn't water it then you watered it too much then it hailed on it and then you went away on holidays for two weeks um, to the south coast because that's probably about the only place we can go uh, these days. Um, and so your cabbage isn't that great. Uh, so I guess what I picked up there was, was really a deep appreciation of just how much passion and knowledge and understanding has to go into producing amazing food. And it sounds like that was probably then a reframing which led to this book. Yeah, so I think one of the things about the River Courage program was that um, despite our culturally we 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 still value the bush we still value farmers uh and i guess that's still that kind of person of the land is still woven into in some way uh maybe in a tokenistic way these days the the kind of national identity um but in reality we are one of the most urbanized populations on earth in australia and we we, we kind of cling to our cities and our country towns our regional areas are becoming increasingly unpopulated the you know the density is kind of dropping down there as our cities grow and expand and um I realised that the program that we made with River Cottage was like was inspiring to people. That was the feedback I was getting, but it was inspiring in a way that was aspirational, not achievable. It was kind of like, wow, one day, one day I'd like to do that. When the kids have left home and I'm in a different position, mm. and I'm like ready to retire. I'll go and you know start a hobby farm. Um, bad idea. If anyone's thinking about doing that, it's like a, a farm is not a retirement plan, a good one. <laughs> it's a really hard physical job. Uh, and, you know, you're better off just like playing golf if you want to retire, not, not hobby farming, unless you want to do some backbreaking labour. Um, and so, I, well, I, I kind of took that information and that realisation that we were a very, um, you know, uh, metropolitan, very uh, urban society mm. and, and looked at the principles that I felt made River Coach popular. And to me, they were kind of a celebration of people, a celebration of place and a celebration of produce. And the three of those things... I feel combined to make a culture, mm -hmm. you know, so that, that when you have those three elements together, every geographic location on the planet will have some unique expression of those three, you know, those three elements, those three pillars of culture. Uh, and I thought, well, what's stopping those principles or those, those, those foundations of culture being transferred to an urban context? Uh, and the answer is nothing. We're human beings uh, and in civilised society have been growing food in cities since cities were a thing. We didn't have refrigerated logistics to ship them internationally or cross state or, or you know, long distances across land. Cities throughout history, uh, including up to very, very recent colonial times, were all cited on their ability to grow and grow food to feed the population that would then call that city home. Um, and, you know, we, we see lots of great, uh, especially in that kind of, you know, 50s imagining of the Australian dream, the quarter acre block, mm. the weatherboard cottage, you know, give me a home among the gum trees, fruit trees and roasts and things like that, that, that there's been some element of food growing happening in, in suburban and urban Australia as well for, for the bulk of its history. And it's, and it's something that I feel like has been only relatively recently lost uh, to a degree. Uh, and that... I'd imagine it would be a reflection of the kind of explosion of convenience culture where, where why would you grow food when you could just click a button and it comes to you, you know? It's, um, why would you go through that like three month 
effort of growing tomatoes when you can just click and collect from your local supermarket. Um, and, but there is, like, I believe there's strong reasons why it's worth that effort. Uh, and that's really what that book is an exploration of. And I wonder if one of the challenges is the fear of getting it wrong, of not knowing exactly yeah. how to do it. Dan, I, I, like, I, I absolutely agree with that. And I think that, that there's, uh, in two elements of the book, that, that fear mm. of a lack of knowledge um, applies to both the growing component of it uh, and of the cooking component of it. And especially in the cookery role, I feel like, that so much of our food culture now is, is um, competitive, that most of the food media that we consume uh, on television in particular is competition format cookery, uh, where you're seeing everyday people you know, that like to cook preparing recipes and then putting their heart and soul and their, you know, their sound bites into that recipe uh, and then, you know, putting it in front of judges and then, you know, being ridiculed or embarrassed or, mm. or praised or, you know, the jeopardy of how that dish or that recipe is going to be received. And human beings have this inherent uh, ability to empathise. It's it, that when, so when we see someone going through something, we can kind of feel it. So I feel that like if we're sitting there watching everyday people cooking food and then having it judged, and you look at it and you go, "Well, that's like a, a restaurant dish," mm. and it's that wasn't good enough. And then you look at like your little stew that you've got in the slow cooker, and you're like, "Oh, well, that's just a plate of brown nutrient dense goodness." Oh, the, they wouldn't like that very much. Uh, whereas really, if you looked into the hearths and stovetops and fireplaces of most cultures throughout history, it would be much more likely to yeah. be brought a, a pot of brown nutrient-dense stew uh, than it would have been some elaborate 25-touch, three-hat, you know, <laughs> fine dining dish uh, with like fake soil and, and foam and gels and, you know, and all this kind of like stuff that, uh, that you need someone to explain to you how to eat it. Uh, and if you just take the leaf to the left and uh, that's actually your serving device and just scoop some of the soil onto that, think of the ocean, look over your left shoulder, turn back to the right and consume, enjoy. Uh, you know, that's obviously a little bit of a, uh, an exaggeration, but I, I, I did my apprenticeship at a place that was very similar to that where like, you know, they'd put food on the table and part of the whole, you know, theatre of the place was, it was kind of meant to bewilder you as a diner. You're like, Oh my God, what do I do next? This, you know, people say eating the flowers on the table because they think it's the third course. They're like, oh, this is good. Oh, no, that's so just clever. table decoration. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I th and there's, I, I think there's a think, a, a, a think tank based here in Canberra called the Australian Institute. And they, um, they, the Australia Institute, not yeah. the Australian Institute, sorry. And they, they commissioned a big study into backyard and home food production in Australia. And, and one of the, key barriers that they identified to stop people uh, growing was that lack of knowledge. Mm. Um, and it's, it's one of those things where it's like another language if you aren't experienced in it. When you, you, when you see people like talking about gardening and talking about growing things and you're like, I don't, I don't know where to start. And so I really wanted to put together a title that, that was really approachable, really accessible. Uh, I find that a lot of gardening titles are written by gardeners for gardeners. You know, it's like if, you know, gardeners buy other gardeners' titles and they're like, it's all detailed and it's got, you know, Latin names and it's got, you know, the exact different, all the things you need to know about soil pH and all this stuff. But Which leaf to use as yeah, the scoop for the ex soil. Ex exactly. <laughs> yes, the lower cotyledon leaves are much better for the... Anyway, I'm just making words up now. Uh, <laughs> not a biologist. <laughs> um, but I wanted to really make something that felt like people could approach it, uh, that families could approach it, and that it created a space where, where people can just feel like they can have a go. And it's, it struck me, by extension of that point, that you've gone through and picked out vegetables and, and fruits. So this one where you've got corn and you, got, you talk about the growing process, what times of the year, how yeah. to go about that, buying it, like where, kind of how to tailor, I guess, or tether purchasing processes, but then also how to go through the whole process of, of that. Uh, how much of that, how much response have you got to that about, re, I guess, demystifying and making that process easier? Uh, I think, yeah, it's been, the response has been great to it. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people have um, used it as a, a bit of a well-thumbed Bible for, their, for beginning their journey into, into backyard food production. And um, I mean, that book was released uh, actually about this time last year and probably about a week ago last year. Uh, sorry, a week 
in the future last, oh, now I'm getting confused on my timelines. My chronology's all out of whack a week ago in the future, but last week, but anyway, <laughs> September 20 something, 2019, it came out. Um, and then so we, I, I guess the coronavirus, uh, the pandemic and the initial lockdown in New South Wales, ACT, the nationwide lockdown, um, and the kind of food shortages that happened there, a lot of people went to their home gardens. Mm. Um, and I remember having a conversation with Clive Blazy of the Diggers Club. I just love a gratuitous name drop every now and then. Clive and I call it, Clive, hey Paul, hey. <laughs> just two beardy gardeners having a chat. Should we get Costa on the line as well? <laughs> uh, and you know, Clive's obviously um, been around for a long time as have the Diggers Clubs. And he said that, uh, Financially difficult times are a boon for gardening businesses because yeah. that's where people go back to, to the basics of feeding themselves. Uh, and people were spending more time at home uh, that, you know, so they could look after a garden. They didn't have all these additional kind of work and stress pressures. Uh, and the fact that people, I think for many of us, uh, the beginning of this year was the first time where you've actually seen that our modern food system is fragile. Uh, we kind of take it for granted that just every time you go to the supermarket, there's going to be food there. Like I, I can't mm. think of a time in my life other than the beginning of this year where you go to a supermarket and you're like, oh, um, I wish my pantry was a bit better stocked. Mm. Uh, and so I think that was a bit of a wake up call for a lot of people to take some sort of control and sovereignty back over their food production. Do you reckon that'll continue on or, or like so many things we, we have a situation albeit we haven't had one like this yes. in our living memory. Yeah. But we'll get to a point in a year's time where that kind of gets forgotten or, or, or you know, rewritten into the history pages. I think pessimistically, you're right. That, uh, that you know, a lot of that... Sorry to bring it down. No, 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 but, the, but, but it's true though. But even if, um, even if, you know, one in a thousand of those people that the passion was sparked mm. for during the pandemic sticks at it, that's a better result than, than no one. But, you know, the, the other uh, barriers to time... Sorry, barriers to entry to home gardening that the, the Australian Institute identified with was time was one of the key things as well. Time, knowledge and, and growing space. And the kicker on your book is building a life around food and community. Yes. The, the pandemic, in my view, is, has made us more acutely aware of how much we depend on a community, uh, yes. being either that in our family, in our neighbourhood. I, I wonder if that's another way of looking at this around community Yes. gardening yeah I don't know what do you think about well, that well I, I kind of feel like the three um, the three areas that I explore in the book mm. of, of growing food preparing food for the table and, and, and community or small family extended group of friends community style events uh, are, are inseparable that it's only been very recently that we've we've kind of you know, delineate, delineate them to, to, you know, the farmer grows food out there, you cook food in your kitchen and you only eat it with yourself or your, you know, immediate family. Mm. Um, whereas throughout the course of human history, the three things have been totally inseparable. They're essentially almost one and the, they're the same process, just different steps. And um, I feel like that they're, you know, and that perhaps has been exposed during the pandemic, that we have psychological needs that are hardwired uh, to, to kind of thrive under those circumstances. When we, when we have food security, when we have emotional uh, security in the form of community, then, then, then the brain's happy. Uh, because we've, we've always strived and needed that as, as, uh, as a social creature. And modern society is, is removing that, that experience for us. We don't prepare our own food. We don't grow our own food. And our communities are increasingly being digitised. That, that, that kind of, that, you know, flesh and blood connection, uh, which has been so essential throughout history, is increasingly being replaced by a digital connection. And, and though our culture and our society is evolving at a rapid rate, like our, our biology can't keep up with that. Our physiology, our, you know, our brain wiring. Mm. So we're changing at this rapid pace but we still have these kind of primal needs of of, of connection to, to other people uh, and to the food that we eat and to the places we live and you've got little boys and, and you focus on they're, they're a part particularly the first part of them being a part of the journey of, yes of that i wonder what what's that been like and and what have, have you learned maybe from them yeah well dig is too old and fat to sell books now he's uh my dog he used to be really cute when we um when we had river cottage and he was kind of like a great you know like oh look at the cute dog so he's on the outer 
Uh, and now the kids are front and centre. Like, look at those cute kids. <laughs> Buy this book. Um, but no, it really does bring you, it brings it into focus. Uh, like so many things in becoming a parent, you know, it's kind of in, in a way can a, a adjust your worldview uh, forcibly uh, because you've got kids there. And um, because you're, you're responsible for the food that they're eating. You know, it's like when you, when you kind of eat for yourself, mm. if, if you're bearing the burden of responsibility for, for yourself, you know, you, you can, it doesn't matter. You have like a, you have a cheeseburger at 11 o'clock at night, whatever, you know, you're like you can get over that. You can justify that to yourself. But when you are the person who is solely responsible along with your partner or whatever for, for kind of nourishing the growth of children, then you're like, oh, Oh, no, cheeseburgers are bad, you know. It's uh, and <laughs> We're having a lettuce I, leaf instead. Yeah, exactly. I like, I wish, I wish that I had like, I could get up here and say, you know, as a kind of cookery and garden writer, when my children aren't growing broccoli, they're eating broccoli. Um, but my three-year-old, for example, the other day, you know, he's this little like nugget little guy. I'm like Bowie, what's your favourite food, mate? What's your favourite thing to eat? Because I'll cook it for you for dinner. He's like, pizza and fish and chips and calamari and barbecue sauce. Uh, and I was like... <laughs> Shoulders slumped uh, a bit. Okay, uh, well, the ones that I make? No, the ones from the shop. <laughs> uh, and, you know, so they're, they're classic. Uh, they're, you know, there's, I'm not like... I just love those, um, you know, the Instagram nutritionist parents that are like, you know, they're like, oh, little, little angel has just prepared herself another bowl of, you know, macrobiotic greens. Incredible. And look at it. I don't even have to convince her. I've got to stop her from eating so much broccoli. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> parent troubles. Uh, you know, and meanwhile. Oh, you must love yeah, I, I, I love, I love it. I love it. I love it. Because, uh, you know, every night, like, I made a, a yellow curry last night and my wife's like, it's got chili in it. You know, like the kids aren't going to eat it. I'm like, and what difference is that going to make from every single other night of the week when I make them food that doesn't have chili in it? And they kind of come up to the table and go. Yeah. <laughs> and I've become that parent. I'm like, well, that's for dinner. That's what's for dinner. <laughs> dad, what's for, what's for dinner, dad? Food. <laughs> food. I stopped telling him what I was actually preparing because usually it was followed rapidly by, I don't like that. I'm like, you had it for dinner last night or two nights ago, you loved it? I'm like, no. Nah. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, but that said, uh, you know, they're not, they are actually pretty good. Uh, and my, the oldest, who's now five, uh, he, he is a chicken whisperer. He's like, he's got his own chooks uh, and he goes out and I'm like, I'll be like, where's Otto? And he'll be up in the chook coop and he'll be like sitting down here like this and there'll be chickens all around him and he'll be holding one like this. And he'd just be spend like 20 minutes up in there and he'd be like hold them up and talk to them. And, uh, and they just, they like, if I come out, they run. You know, maybe they saw some episodes of River Cottage uh, through, the, <laughs> through the TV. But if he comes out, they kind of like go down on the ground like this and they let him scoop him up. And he's also, um, he's also hounding me to get the beehive going. Uh, and he's also, he's growing some carrots. <laughs> He's growing some carrots. And he's got a mint plant that he likes to eat. I don't know if it's like a, 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 a precursor to a mojito addiction later in life. Uh, but he's like, I think he's, that's about the only salad he eats. Like he won't eat anything else green. Like I put a bit of lettuce on a sandwich, forget it. He's like, even if, yeah, you can't even hide it in there. Like under the cheese or between the ham. Nah, no chance. What's this? <laughs> Ah, oh, push the whole plate away, but he loves <laughs> coming out every morning. Yeah, yeah, but a mint leaf, like off the bush, only off the bush though. So he comes out, he waters his little carrots, which are about this tall at the moment, <laughs> you know, and there, which is a great exercise uh, in patience for a child as well, because carrots are one of the longest things that take to germinate. And they're like, why? And his brother grew some, um, some like salad greens that like germinated in like thirty seconds. <laughs> And, so, and he's the, the, so the older brother's like, how could Bowie seeds germinate first? Oh, my, when my carrots can water me like this? So, so it, I mean, it's, it's really nice to be able to take that, uh, them on that kind of experience of, of growing It must food. be lovely to be able to share that. Yeah, with oh, them. absolutely. Like it does. It kind of, you know, it gives me a great deal of pride yeah. and, and enjoyment to see them. Just, just to see them enjoying it, you know, like yeah. it hasn't been something I've tried to like, you know, force feed them or ram down their necks. It's, um, it's just something that, that I do and that they've kind of come to enjoy the beauty of in their own, their own way, you mm -hmm. know. So that's, um, yeah, they're, he's, they're budding little gardeners. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> What's the no dig garden? 
Uh, so an OD garden, uh, I mean, there's been some form of them for, for a long time mm. uh, throughout the course of agriculture, but I guess the, the, the term no dig garden was popularised by a Sydney gardener called Esther Dean in the, I think it was the 70s, 60s or 70s. And it's, it, it, was, it came from her as a result of having a food garden on those really poor, you know, kind of sandstony soils around Kurungai, uh, Hornsby area up there in the north of Sydney. And sometimes if, like, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not blessed with a, a block with great soil, which most people in Australia are not, uh, because we've got very, very few pockets of great arable land, um, sometimes like planting in the ground is, can be one of the main reasons why people fail. Mm. Because it's, like, it's not as simple as just planting a seed in the ground and giving it water. If the, the soil profile's not there, if the nutrition and life and charge of the soil isn't right, then you know, the plant's doomed from the start. So no-dig gardening is about kind of building layers of organic matter above the ground uh, and you know, bringing it all in rather than just buying like a giant mountain of you know, veggie mix uh, soil from a landscaping supply place you you're kind of using like compost and manure and, and carbonaceous materials like straw uh, hay paper and you you build this uh, another term for it is like a lasagna gardener because it's like a layer of compost layer of soil mm -hmm. layer of you know of straw and water all in and that actually makes a really beautiful environment for growing plants in because there's a lot of nutrition in there uh it's, it's almost a cross between, um, or like a, I guess, like a hydroponic growing and, a, and an in-soil growing because there's actually a lot of air in there. It's not just like dense, compacted soil, but that allows a lot of root freedom. And so if, you, if you've got a rental property and, you know, you're not kind of allowed to rip up the, the lawn and, and, you know, plant, you know, 40 square metres of veggies, then a no-dig garden can be a great way to just build on the surface. Uh, and it's also a really great option if you... Um, if you don't have great soil it's a way that and you know the the garden actually breaks down over time and you can replenish it with additional layers every year that you plant and through the processes of soil microbiology you're actually a lot of that nutrition and organic material that initially goes into the no dig bed through microbial and, mm. and kind of macro environment you know like worms and things like that it gets taken down and enriches the soil underneath so, so actually you're building soil twist that turns yeah. that that bad soil on its head exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so where you're does composting it. fit in all of that uh so uh, well composting is just that is I don't, it should be taught in schools. I know, I know it is, but it should be taught as like a, a, a fundamental living skill because I know from, from the work that I've done with, you know, state governments and local councils that, that organic food waste is one of the biggest problems in particular for the cities because it's, you know, it makes up about 65% of all landfill. Uh, and because it's an organic compound, it, it breaks down, it does so anaerobically, it causes all these problems with leachates and gases. And it's a real environmental management drama, especially for cities. Yeah. Um, whereas you can kind of take that, uh, all the food that you produce uh, and the scraps that you do produce, and you can make this incredible elixir and tonic for soil that will enrich any soil. There's no soil that doesn't benefit from composting. And it's, I guess it's a bit more of a, a, an, a, an appreciation of the fact that, that, you know, through physics, everything, it's a closed loop. That if, you, if a food item is being grown on a farm somewhere and then transported to you, you eat a portion of it, some portion of it goes in the bin, the land where that vegetable or where that meat was raised has been diminished to create what you have. Mm -hmm. And then in a traditional ecology, you know, you live in a certain area, you die there, you defecate there, you know, it's just the nutrient cycle mm. continues. But because of the way we do it, you know, we export that nutrient, uh, it goes through our wastewater treatments or into the landfill. And so we then become more dependent on uh, chemical agriculture to prop up our soils and our food production because we've got this extractive process. Um, and again, that's a very modern phenomenon where we became dependent on chemical agriculture after the Second World War. And most traditional societies have, um, have really respected the soil and respected that nutrition cycle. So, I mean, composting it can, be, it can be a little bit touchy, I reckon, if you haven't done it before. I think a lot of people kind of just get one of the black bins. They just keep chucking their veggie scraps in there and then it's full of rats and like 
flies and, you know, it stinks and it's like this kind of sl unusable sludge. And you're like, oh, I tried composting. Yeah, exac exactly. And they, they go out, they, they have a look in, they pull that phase, they sell the compost bin on leave Gumtree. The, leave the house. And they, yeah, they never, never worry about it again. Yep. Um, but, you know, you're, you're essentially playing microbiologist and you need to create that, that perfect environment for the microbes to do their work aerobically. But there are other ways, you know, that if... if you don't want to compost. I mean, worm farming is another great one. You know, they can they can live in those little worm cafes or converted bathtubs or even just something as simple as two buckets stacked on top the, of each there's other. There's even the, the versions uh, that you can just kind of dig into your garden yeah. bed. Yeah, It's got just a cute little lid on the top. Yep. And because you just kind of throw your stuff in that. And I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure that it's a bit more complex than that. Yeah, but, but it really isn't though. Isn't it? You know, no, it's, uh, you know, the the the... Natural systems of the world are, you know, are long evolved and very powerful for dealing with things like recycling nutrition yeah. back into ecology. It's, uh, we, just, we just have to kind of help. We well, talked about how it's a challenge for cities. The, the ACT has been running a whole heap of trials around the green bins yes. uh, for, I think, this very purpose. Is that part of the solution? I mean, obviously, you're talking and you touch on uh, how we can all be doing a little something. Is that p the other part of it as well? Yeah, I think at the, at the city scale, certainly, because there's, I mean, in the book, I, I guess I, I gave an option for of some sort of nutrition recycling uh, for no matter what circumstances you have. Um, you know, for example, if you live in a unit and you don't have a garden, you can use things like Bokashi, which is like a, a, a Japanese system where you essentially take your food scraps, you inoculate them with a, a certain strain of bacteria and it digests it. It's like fermented food scraps and that makes it much more stable to go and dig out into your garden. And it's not compost, but it's not straight food scraps either. And you can leave that under your kitchen sink. Uh, then if you've got a small space, but no ground, you can worm farm. If you've got a regular backyard, you can compost, you can keep chickens. I, I, I haven't been composting lately because my chickens just do such a great job mm. at it, you know. But that said, some people aren't going to have the inclination. Some people aren't going to have the time yeah. and maybe they just don't care. Uh, but still they, as consumers of food and creators of food waste, they are, they're a part of that nutrition cycle, that nutrient recycling process. At the moment, it's just going into the ground, into landfill and causing trouble. Mm -hmm. So I know I, I remember a couple of councils in Sydney kicked off with the, the FOGO, Food and Organic Waste. Oh, I'm terrible with acronyms. Food and ground up organs? I don't know. A FOGO. What? It's called FOGO anyway. It's FOGO. I'm Did just trying to think of that up? food, organ, <laughs> and in garden. No, no, I don't know what it says. I'm going to stop guessing now. Some sort of program. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, like. yeah, yeah. The FOGO. Uh, isn't that like the puffer fish liver? That you eat? That's FOGO. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they, they, were, they were composting at the city scale out, in, uh, out near Western Sydney there. And it was this incredible operation. And, and then that material that they used then went back to um, Broadacre Agriculture, west of the Divide. So mm. there was the cities were creating nutrition that then went back to the, the kind of country that was growing the food to feed the cities. It's essentially completing that loop that yeah. you mentioned about where the, the food comes from in the first place. Exactly. Mm. And... Because that can obviously, go, going back to your earlier point about the no-dig gardens, that can all help immensely with the soil quality, can't it? Without a doubt. I and mean, that's if, if people have got terrible soil, I know dig garden's the first place that I point them to because it's like a raised garden that is that you don't have to buy like high embodied energy materials like metal and you know, or you don't have to make a timber enclosure or it doesn't have to be permanent even. You can just grow it in one spot and then throughout the course of one, two, three seasons, all that nutrition's f filtering into the soil underneath and yeah, you are building soil. Mm. But the whole school of thought around companion planting and, and where things should go compared to others in your garden. Yes. Well, I've never been, I've never been great with companion planting. Um, sometimes, I guess, I just like, just like to see if plants like one another. <laughs> it's like speed, like, speed dating yeah, exactly, your garden. Yeah, like exactly. Married at first sight or something like planted at first sight. <laughs> uh, and just like putting them all in there. I'm like, sir, this, is, this should be interesting. <laughs> Except for Otto who's waiting yeah, on the tiny yeah, little Yeah, yeah, come on. Carrots. Grab the carrots. <laughs> um, I, and I think maybe things like companion planting are one of those things that, that when you're starting to garden, that you start thinking about, oh, companion, am I doing the right thing? Is, is this the companion planting? Uh, but it's like a very nuanced, perhaps like advanced skill mm. 
that that maybe stops people from having a go because they don't understand that as well. So I just encourage people just to throw things in the ground. Just see have what, a go. Just see have what a happens. Go. Yeah, 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 yeah. What do you find easiest to grow? Uh, I you find do touch on in your uh, my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, being on the coast down there, it just you know, it just grows. I'm constantly bloody mowing it. I'm sick of it because I can't eat it. I can't have goats to keep it down. I can't have a cow that I tie up out the front of my house to to mow my lawn uh, in downtown Bermagui, unfortunately. But <laughs> but uh, in terms of the thing. Things I find easiest to grow that I can eat uh, <laughs> would be uh, things like mescaline leaf mixes, things that like are edible leaves that don't form a head. They're just like things like rocket and mizuna, um, loose head lettuces. And I usually just buy, you know, big seed bag mixes of that uh, and just brew and, and sow about a meter square every fortnight, maybe every month in winter. Um, and then that they just grow like gangbusters. Mm. Keep the water up to it. Keep the chickens off it because it's also the chickens' favourite spot. If they ever get out of the coop, <laughs> they just go straight to the salad bar and they just like tear it to shreds. Um, and yeah, and really like it's those plants are, are very have very low nutritional requirements uh, and they're very fast growing. You know, you can kind of eat the leaves because it's not creating a fruit, you know, you can, you can eat them when they're that big. You can eat them as a microgreen. Whereas, you know, if you try to grow something like an ox heart tomato, you know, you've, there's so many steps where it can go wrong for you. And that's, you know, the tomato is the kind of the number one thing that people want to grow. And things like little cherry tomatoes, mm. very easy to grow, but those big, you know, thick slicing tomatoes, you've got to get the nutrition and the water. There's not a lot of wiggle room. They, are, they can be relatively forgiving, but, you know, you've got to be pretty on your game to, to get a really big, tasty tomato. Whereas the cherry tomatoes, I don't even, I don't even plant cherry tomatoes because they just grow. They just you know, pop like up. Any, once, you've, once you've grown one cherry tomato on your, on your property, you'll have cherry tomatoes for, for life. Yeah. So, a bit like pumpkins, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, but see, <laughs> they I, take a while at the start. But, yeah, they but once they're off, they're they off. They take over. Don't, don't, have a, don't have a nap in the garden <laughs> in January when the pumpkins are on the loose. I, uh, but I, I like growing pumpkins as well, um, mainly because I need them for photo shoots. Because, you know, as someone that does a, like a, a rural style program like River Cottage, you can't have your photo taken without a pumpkin so and a is, hay bale. Is that the rule? That's the rule. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, that's the unspoken good rule. To, good to Plaid know. shirt, hay bale, pumpkin. Sorted. Country. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, and in fact, I did ask the lovely folk at Florida to provide bale. me a hay bale to sit on, but instead I've got one of these chairs. But I'll, I guess I'll endure. Um, but I do <laughs> so like... resilient. I, yeah. I'm a tough, I'm a tough guy. I'll sit anywhere. Um, but I like putting a pumpkin in, Dan, because it makes you, like, they're just so voracious in the garden. If you've got the space, you've got one plant, it's just like, look at my abundant garden. It's just this one pumpkin plant climbing all over everything. Like, the garden's going off this summer. Have a look at it. <laughs> just don't lie down for too long. Five minutes max. And, you know, the tendrils start wrapping around the leg. Oh, lost another neighbour. <laughs> Well, what, what would you say as a starting point for anyone who's not sure where to, where to go about starting? I mean, obviously, you, you can, the book is a good starting point, but, but what Thanks, sort Dan. of vegetables should they start with? Uh, well, uh, the, the ones I find easiest to grow myself. Right. Uh, and you know, and I, I recommend to people to start growing in containers or pots as the first thing because it's, you, know, you, can, you can grow a, 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 you know, a decent-sized pot, like something like you know, one of these baskets or even as small as the kind of little pots that are held within there. You can, you can grow a little salad in there, you know, a little salad mix, you know? And if it's something like this, you know, a pot, say that size, you're looking probably two $7 bags of potting mix, 14 bucks, $3 bag of seeds, you know, $18. Uh, and then, you know, you'll probably get, I don't know, maybe two or three harvests, weeks worth of harvest off that for a family of two that eat salad because, you know, I don't know anyone else's kids that eat salad. I don't have to factor my children into the salad eating. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just mint, out. just mint. Yeah, they're like, oh, too peppery, spicy dad. Um, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Go and eat your mint. Um, and really, like, then you're not, you know, you're not kind of committing to, to digging up a big chunk of your backyard because I, I think, like, as the other kind of negative media 
aspect of gardening, just like we've got competitive cookery for cooking. And when it comes to gardening, we've got this like block, backyard blitz mentality where it's like, okay, so I've got this rundown quarter acre block with just grass and an old gum tree. I'm going to turn it into a 500 square metre market garden this weekend. <laughs> Jamie uh, Jury pops yeah, out oh, from exactly, you know, you behind go, the gum tree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, oh, put your shirt back on, mate. It's not manpower anymore. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you go to Bunnings and like you get all the stuff and you kind of stress because it's weekend at Bunnings and you're buying stuff. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you need. So you go in that kind of like crazy. I better get one of those. I better get one of those. Oh, I'm going to need a new shovel because I haven't got that. That's the Bunnings trap, isn't it? Yeah, that's it? the trap, you know. And then you're kind of into it for a thousand bucks uh, and you're already stressed. And then you go and you like you do with the back breaking because the, the only first thing you part, forgot is your lettuce uh, yeah, seeds. Exactly, you know. And then you kind of have this massive weekend on your vegetable garden. Uh, you put all this like financial and, and physical effort into it. And then you're just like, you don't want to look at it for a month. You know, you're done. Whereas like gardening is not, it's the opposite of a blitz. Like, you know, if, if a blitz can be handy in a garden, like getting some friends over and, you know, if you've got a big weedy garden bed, invite a couple of friends over, cook them lunch and, you know, get everyone to get stuck into the garden, uh, you know, tell them that's what's happening, uh, yeah. obviously, <laughs> first. And we're like, come over for lunch. Oh, before we eat, if you could just put those boots and gloves on and just no, help no, me weed the nettle patch. No one comes to dinner parties in <laughs> no, your house no, 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 anymore. No. <laughs> I guess I'll eat your dinner, son, as well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but you know, there, it can be disheartening when you put so much effort yeah. in and, and we're so accustomed to immediate results that, that, you know, like a long game of like three months, four months for a yield, uh, you can, your enthusiasm can wane significantly in that period. Mm -hmm. And so gardening, like, I don't find it's like, a, it's like a big effort, no effort type thing. Uh, it's a, a little bit, a lot. Right. So even if, you know, you kind of like try to spend five, 10 minutes in the garden every day, uh, you're like, I haven't got time to do the garden, I've got to work. But just taking that five minutes in the evening or in the morning to walk around, water a couple of things, watch them, you'll be amazed at how much just that little bit of daily TLC will benefit your garden. And if you don't have a lot of experience, it's like, like in anything, start small. You know, like any, trying to learn any skill, you don't go from like not playing the piano to trying to master Rachmaninoff. You know, you get like, you get three blind mice down pat first. And, uh, you know, and growing some salads in a pot, not even in the soil, at your back door is the three blind mice of food growing. And part of it is the psychology of actually being in your garden and being yeah. around plants. And it just makes us feel good, doesn't it? Oh, I, you know, and that's that... Um, the, the nature connection, you know, it's a, and I, I kind of make a whole heap of scientifically unfounded claims about human psychology and physiology and ancestry, which I've been doing this whole, uh, this whole talk and do pretty much all the time. Uh, but, you know, having that connection to the natural world, seeing it, experience it, even if it's, you know, that's why we love pets, that's why we love house plants. Mm -hmm. We live in, you know, a world, especially in the urban and suburban environment, that is incredibly disconnected from the ecology that supports us and that we've evolved within. And I, I believe that we're hardwired to want. Uh, and so having a garden, and it helps you reconnect with that. And it also slows you down and brings you to nature's pace. You know, it's not like it's not a daily deadline. It's not like a before lunch deadline or a close of business thing where you're like, go do this, go do this, go do this. You see these like incremental monthly mm. changes where, you know, like a plant might, you know, like you just see the new bud stain. Like spring's a great time for seeing that, obviously, where, you know, you just start to see the new leaves come out and you see the little blossoms form. And then the next day, the little leaves are a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And, you know, you kind of go on this like journey of growth with the plants in your garden. And, and I think having that, that, that kind of, ability to slow down and just zero in on on stuff like i love it i like it. i just sit there at the back no wonder my kid does it with the chickens because sometimes i'll just be there going like this just staring at him eyeballing that mint, yeah just that yeah, mint tree oh, mint push. yeah <laughs> that mint plant's getting smaller i thought it was meant to be growing but you know you can get lost in it you know and and what i love about gardens is that that there's so much variation to the level of detail that you can engage with. You know, you can engage with a, like a giant fruit tree or a big gum tree or, or like, or an entire forest, mm. or you can sit there on a little patch of ground and you can look at, you know, a patch of bare dirt the size of your thumbnail and see all the incredible little creatures that are crawling over that and all the little interactions they have. And kids are another great one for that because they bring you down to that level yeah. and that pace. You know, you kind of walk around doing your adult stuff, you're on your fourth long black, you're like, oh, my eyeballs are popping out of my head on a Saturday morning, I've got to get the money through the car kids and they're like dad look at these ants and you're like oh 
No, just kidding. I wouldn't oh. do that. No, 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 no. Opposite. No, no, no. That's I would never do that. Uh, you know, it's great to kind of get down and, and then you know and kind of get that like that innocence and joy and and that kids have in their appreciation for yeah. the natural world because we all have it. We've just as adults, I think, sometimes with the pressures of modern life and you know adulthood that we that we forget that it's important to connect with those simple yeah. little things. I think that it's. it's <laughs> True. <laughs> uh, what, do, what do you want to be the takeout? Because we've, we've touched on a whole lot of different areas. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that if um, what I'd like for the takeaway to be is to, that, to appreciate how much benefit there is uh, to us as individuals and families and communities to reconnecting in some way, no matter how small, to how your, fo- how your food is grown, how it's prepared and who you share it with. And ideally, you grow some even microscopic part of it. You make things yourself in your own kitchen and you share the fruits of the labor for both those tasks with the people that mean the most in the world to you. And really, you know, that's if you if you can get those three things in place, there's not a lot else that you need for happiness. You know, if you can satisfy those three criteria of food security, nourishing food, feeding your family and your friends, and having a dynamic and strong community life, then that is really about all we need. Yeah, it sounds like a, a plenty, to, plenty. To, to, to help us all to connect. That and a Ferrari. Well, but <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please thank Paul West. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Oh. <laughs> and you can check out the Edible Garden on Booktopia and uh, find out more details on the Floriard website where there's also plenty of extra detail about all of the events happening. Floriard Reimagined 2020. Yeah, thanks for your time.